Hey guys, this is Anthony Morganti from AnthonyMorganti.com. This is episode 9 of the video series where I critique and process your image. In this episode, we're taking a look at this image from Robin. Now, real quick before I start, let me say that when I began this series, I mentioned several times that I won't be able to do everyone's image. Now, thank you everyone that have sent me images. I've received several hundred. And again, I'll say I won't be able to do everyone's image. Please don't message me or email me asking me when I'm going to get to your image. All right. Please understand that I have so many, it's going to be impossible to do all of them. Now, I am picking images to do based on one criteria mainly. And that is, can I teach something about photography if I process and critique the image? In this image here, I really, I think I could teach a few things about photography. So that's why I chose it. It doesn't mean that I think your image stinks if I didn't pick it, all right? I'm just trying to teach something about photography. And the second thing is I'm trying to pick images from people all over the world, men and women, not just men in a certain geographical area. So, um, so you try to understand um, and I'd appreciate it. Now I do appreciate everyone sending me your images. This image is going to be great. I think we could learn a lot of things from it. Now, first of all, there's a couple things to talk about here. We used a really wide angle lens. It's a 16 millimeter lens. And whenever you get much over like 24 millimeters, sometimes even 35 millimeters, depending on the lens, you'll get a lot of different types of distortion introduced into the scene. And in this case here, what you'll get is anything that is tall on the outside of the frame will tend to bend in towards the center of the frame or tilt in towards the center of the frame. And you can see how this crane looks like it's tilted that way. This building looks like it's tilted that way. And with any lens, really, it doesn't matter if it's wide angle or not, um, any normal lens, if there's a tall building in the midground to background and you take the picture of the building, it tends to look like it's falling backwards. And you can see in this building here, it looks like it's falling backwards also. So these are distortions that are introduced by the lens. Now, you, it's a creative decision. Do you want to correct for those distortions or do you want to leave them in the image? Sometimes it is a pretty cool image when you have big tall buildings and they're tilted in towards the center. but if you're a real estate photographer, you have to correct for the distortions. You have to have everything nice and straight and square. So in my opinion, in this image, I want to correct the distortion. So I want everything nice and straight and as square as possible. So we're going to talk about how we're going to do that. Now, before I get into that, let's just talk about the camera settings. Um, in the scene itself, I really like that we have a person in the scene. Um, it's really kind of a boring scene, tell you the truth. There's not a lot here. The sky's kind of interesting, but there's not a lot here outside of a person's in the scene. It's just a focal point, something for us to see. And there's a leading line that leads to the person also. Several leading lines, actually. We have the path. We have the ends of the path. We have the railing coming up. All these lines are leading to the focal point, which is the person running through the scene. And Robin used a great shutter speed to freeze a person running, one one thousandth of a second. So usually between one five hundredth of a second, one one thousandth of a second, depending how fast the person is running, will freeze them. And sometimes for creative purposes, you might to like to have the person blurred, but other times you'd like to have them frozen. In this case, I think it looks fine with the uh, young lady frozen in the scene. Looks good. Now. It's a 16 millimeter, 16 to 50 millimeter lens, f3.5 to 5.6. So at 16 millimeters, it's effectively f3.5 lens. At f shooting at 5.6, Robin's about a, a stop and a third up from wide open. And preferably, I mentioned many times, you'd prefer to be two to four stops up from wide open. That's kind of most lenses' sweet spot, and that's where you're going to get the sharpest image two to four stops up from wide open. You stop down any more than that, you tend to start getting lens diffraction, which causes like pixel distortion and you won't be as crisp and clear and well focused, I guess is a, for a way to put it on, on the image. So two to four stops up. So it would have been, I think I would have preferred to see Robin shoot this at F8 to F11. Now in doing that, Obviously, the shutter speed might not have been one one-thousandth of a second. If you're in aperture priority mode, you go up to F11, 
you're suddenly going to be shooting at, you know, one two fiftieth of a second. So it went and froze the runner. So what do you do? Well, you have to increase the ISO. So you put the ISO at uh, like 400 and then you should be good to go. You're going to freeze the runner and you're down at an aperture where you'll have a lot of depth of field and the lens is at its strongest, sharpest at that point. So those of you that don't understand maybe the, what the, 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 is often referred to as the exposure triangle, go Google it right now. Stop the video. Google exposure triangle. You really have to understand the relationship between shutter speed, ISO, and aperture. And it really will make you a better photographer once you understand that the relationship between those three key facets of photography. And then I think you'll see that you'll be a lot more creative and you'll be able to do a lot more with your photography once you understand that. Now, I'm not saying Robin didn't understand this at all. I'm just, I, it, it, the, it worked. I mean, what Robin did here, I would have just preferred that Robin was more F8, F11 on the aperture. And you probably would have had to up the ISO a little bit to take care of that. So, all right, now what are we going to do about processing in the distortion itself? Well, we're going to go over here, and this was done with a uh, mirrorless camera. So when we go to lens corrections, you can see that the uh, built-in lens profile was already applied. You could remove chromatic aberration. So we we're, took care of that. Now we're going to go to the transform tab. Now a lot of people mess, uh, email me or they'll write in just, you know, um, the comments below that they don't have a transform tab. It came in a latter version of Lightroom 6. Like it wasn't in 6.0. I couldn't tell you. Like 6.4 something like that, or CC 2015.4. One of the latter versions introduced this transform tab. Most of these controls if in your version of Lightroom 5 or an earlier version, if you don't have this tab, are under the Lens Correction tab. If you're missing the tab altogether and the controls aren't in the Lens Correction tab, just right-click on any of these tabs and make sure that Transform is checked. If it's not checked, it won't be there, see? So make sure that's checked. And there it is. So we're going to go to the Transform tab. And Auto works for me a little bit more probably than half the time. Uh, in this one, it just glancing at it, it might be difficult because we have a lot of lines in the image. So if I click Auto, let's see what happens. All right, it kind of overcorrected in my opinion. It has the image, the buildings don't seem like they're falling backwards as much the entire image is tilted down on the right hand side so i don't think auto did such a good job so we're going to go with off now you could try full i don't think that's going to work either yeah that's horrible so we don't like that so we're going to like if you click click constraint crop see <laughs> it just took out too much there so we're going to go back to off and we're going to go back up here and we're going to go back to as shot because that screwed up our crop all right so we're going to have to do this manually. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to straighten it. And there's not a perfect line in here. Like I really can't see the horizon to straighten it perfectly. But there is a bridge off here in the distance. So I'm just going to eyeball it and use that bridge to straighten it. And to straighten it, I'm going to go to rotate. And I'm just going to turn rotate until it looks to me to be straight. Now it still might be off a little. It's hard to tell because we have distortion. The buildings are still kind of tilted in. So I could come back and readjust these later, you know, once we tweak a little more. So now we have a couple different distortions. We have the building falling backwards. They're kind of tilted away and they're tilted in. And sometimes if you correct the falling backwards part, it kind of corrects the tilting in part at the same time. So we're going to go to vertical and we're going to move the vertical slider this way and you can see how it's kind of tilting the image towards us and it's straightening out these buildings not only straightening them out so it doesn't look like they're falling backwards but it looks like they're nice and straight up and down there's still a little distortion there but it's much much better you can see the crane now looks like it's more straight straight up and down so I kind of like that now we have white pixels down here it actually distorts the image to get it to be not distorted. So what we're going to do is we're going to click right here where it says constrain crop. And you can see now it looks pretty straight um, to me. I think it looks okay. So it still might be slightly tilted that way, but I'm not sure. that it, Maybe, you know, we're assuming this bridge is perfectly straight back here. It might not be. It might 
be higher on this side of this canal than it is on this side. So for now, I'm going to say that's okay. It looks good. Now, the composition, once we have this all straightened out, one thing I should add too, uh, when you do lens corrections and you do corrections like these transform corrections, it is very taxing on the microprocessor of your computer. And Lightroom might get really sluggish when you do these controls and then you go back up and you start using the brush or any of the tools especially. It'll get really sluggish and you'll be brushing and you'll be way behind or it'll be herky-jerky and that's because of that. So you might have to come in and turn off the, uh, the transform uh, tab then come in and do it. Do your... Um, you know, do whatever you're doing so that it works more smoothly, then come back in and turn on the transform tab and or the lens correction tab, all right? So just keep that in mind if it might affect your computer adversely. Now, the composition itself, it would have been better too if the girl was uh, in a like a rule of intersection for the rule of thirds, like if she was right here. I think that would have been a stronger composition. Now, it's hard to say... Um, you know, we got we still have a lot of great compositional uh, facets in the image that are contributing greatly to making it pleasing to look at. That is, we have the leading line of the path, we have the leading line of this railing, and they're all leading right to the focal point, the girl. Now, it would just been stronger if we could have got her, or if she was over here. Now, I don't think any more cropping, I mean, I could crop it, I could pull in from the side and get her over this edge here but if I crop too many pixels away then it's kind of not the resolution isn't as good and we tend to not want to crop too much we already crop quite a bit so we could try to look at a different compositional overlay and see if something else might work so I'm gonna hit the O key on the keyboard and by the way if you didn't notice I'm in the crop tool so I'm gonna hit the O key on the keyboard and the one I'm thinking of specific specifically specifically is the golden spiral and there it is right there and it's actually configured right where I want it if she is just over just a little bit I think it would work a lot better so we don't have to crop it that much now I want the padlock lock because I mentioned many times that I like to keep my three to two aspect ratio I like to not lose that aspect ratio so I'm just gonna pull in from this side it's still cropping a lot of pixels out but now we have her like pretty much on top of that spiral and I tell you the truth I really didn't like the crane in the picture at all and I didn't think it was adding anything so we got rid of the crane totally and now we'll click enter to accept that crop now to me that's a stronger composition now once it's cropped it does look like maybe it's it's just not perfectly straight so I'm gonna come back over to the rotate and I'm just going to go the other way with it I think yeah, that's more straight all right, just eyeballing it. So there we go. Now we kind of got rid of all those lens distortions best we could. Um, I have it cropped where it looks to be a little more pleasing to the eye. And I think we're ready to actually process the image. So we're going to go, go up to the basic panel. And I'm going to pull highlights down to try to get some detail in the sky. Before I do that, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll hit the J key on the keyboard to see if anything's clipping. And the sky isn't clipping, surprisingly. It's really bright but it's not clipping. If it were clipping, you would get red. I can't even make a clip. There. You'd get red if it was clipping. So typically you don't want clipping. So we're going to turn off those clipping indicators by hitting the J key. But I'm going to put highlights down to try to get more detail up in there. And we have a lot of dark areas. Now this really, this scene was really taxing to the sensor on the camera. We have a lot of dynamic range. Dynamic range is the range of tones a range of grays basically that are between the whitest white and the blackest black that is in the scene and there's a lot of dark areas a lot of bright areas a lot of stuff in between and the camera seemed to perform very well it was a Sony as you could see here so we're going to open up the shadows quite a bit this is what I normally do is I flatten it out quite a bit um, we're gonna add some vibrance I actually might do this in black and white but what I'll typically do is I'll I'll do it in color first and see how I like it. And right now, and I don't think I'm going to send this to a plugin at all. I'm going to do everything in Lightroom. I don't think a there's a plugin that I have that I think would add anything to it that I can't do in Lightroom. So 
Um, since there's not a lot of color in the image, I'll, I'll add some saturation. Typically, I usually add some vibrance and very little saturation. So even 11 and 8 is probably less than what most people add. So I'm going to leave it there. I jump down to the tone curve, and I'm going to try strong contrast. That looks pretty good. And medium contrast. I'm going to put strong contrast. I like that look. And then we're going to get a white point by holding the shift key in while I double click on the word whites. And then I'm going to hold the shift key in and double click on the word blacks to get a black point. My white point is too bright. So I'm going to hold the alter option key in and click down on it. You can see that we have a lot of clipping now down there. It looks like the blues are clipping a little and green tiny bit. So I'm going to back that off until we have a totally black screen right there. Now that is a little better to me. Now the, the blacks are a little bit too black. I have shadows opened up pretty far. We're just going to bring that just a little bit, just a little bit more like that. I just want to see a little more detail down in here. I don't want it to be totally black. One thing I do encourage you to, if you don't, uh, calibrate your monitor. Uh, having a, a calibrated monitor is imperative to processing your images properly. What you might think is perfectly processed image, when you send it off to a lab and get printed, you're going to get back an image that usually is going to be way too dark. And that's because most of us tend to keep our monitors very, very bright. And it's brighter than it should be. And then when you actually print the image, they come back dark. So um, be careful. Calibrate your monitor. Uh, get a calibration tool that has an ambient light sensor on it that you will leave plugged into the computer. And I think every five minutes, the one I use will actually do an ambient light setting and readjust my monitor to match the light in the room so that I always know that what I'm looking at is probably what's going to be printed and probably what someone else is going to see on their properly calibrated monitor. All right, so I encourage you to do that. All right, now um, I'm pretty much, I think, done with the basic panel, but I want to deal with this sky. Uh, the sky is a lot of possibilities here, but it is still pretty bright, and I think I want to do something with it. Now, I said before uh, that I'm not a big fan of the graduated filter, but I think in this case it would work very well. And when I do use graduated filters, I tend to not use them, whoops, not the crop tool, I tend to not use them straight down. I tend to use them differently. Uh, so we're going to open the graduated filter and I'm going to get a, a uh, reset the filter by double clicking on the word effect. And I'm going to bring exposure down. And I'm going to go from the corner and I'm just going to bring it down from the corner like pretty far like that and I think I want to move it oops didn't want to do that so I'm gonna hit command Z I'm gonna grab it there and I want to move it if it'll let me move it there we go more that way less on the building and I'm gonna actually take it away from the building so let's see let's play around here it's a little too dark let's add some contrast now I'm just looking at the sky right now And um, I could add some clarity. Okay, that's kind of cool. Now, I don't like what it did to the building. So what I want to do is I want to get a brush tool. If you, if Not the brush tool, but inside of the um, graduated filter, you'll see it has new, edit, and brush. I'm going to click on brush. And we're going to click on erase. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take away the graduated filter on the building. Now I'm going to just do it real quick. I would recommend that you go much slower and make sure that you do a really good job. But I don't like the building dark. I just want really the sky dark. Okay, so you can see here. I'm basically erasing the graduated filter from the building. Like that. Okay. All right, so there is before the graduated filter, there is with the graduated filter. Now, um, I think I'm going to add another one. So I'm going to double click on the word new. Okay, and we have exposure down, and I'm going to come from the other angle, like this, and just kind of equalize the sky a little bit by eyeballing it might have it a touch too dark on the other side. 
It might be too dark over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to that button and just click on it. So we have that graduated filter selected. And I'm just going to take exposure off more, you know, a little less, a uh, little more exposure, I should say. So it looks a little more even. And I like that. So there is before the graduated filters with the graduated filters. Now, it is making this darker over here and maybe the lady will darker a little bit. So what we could do on the second one, make sure we're selected on that second one. You could see if I hover over it, we'll get that um, mask overlay and we could see what the graduated filter is actually affecting. So it is hitting her a little bit and I just really want to affect the sky. So we're going to get a brush again or the brush tool that is underneath the graduated filter. We're going to make sure we're on a race and what we're going to do so I'm going to get a larger one right now and make sure that I make sure that that graduated filter is just affecting the sky and not our runner and not necessarily those bushes. And they're kind of dark up in here, but that is not a big deal to me. I don't like that one. What we'll do is we'll get a smaller filter. There we go didn't like that either see how it is bleeding over into the sky so what you could do is you could click auto mask and sometimes that will help you confine your brush stroke to what you actually clicked on now you could see it's still hitting the sky so there's not much I could do there so you know it looks okay I mean those you can see even right here these are naturally darker over in here so this you know it just looks like it's darker there that's no big deal so I'm happy with that. And let me make sure I got out here. And I got across here. Yes. All right. There is before the graduated filters with the graduated filters. So I'm pretty much done with the graduated filter. I like the sky now. Um, you know, it's okay as a color image. Let's see what it would look like in black and white. What I would usually do is I right click on the uh, thumbnail that is down here in the film strip and I go up to create virtual copy. And with the virtual copy is what I'll convert to black and white just to see what it will look like. So I'll convert to black and white there. Another alternative you could do is down here in camera calibration, a lot of cameras, now I don't know, I've never done this with the Sony, um, a lot of let's go back to HSL sorry all right back in color you go down here to the camera calibration a lot of cameras will have a black and white um, option and this uh, Sony doesn't but it does have vivid and things like that you could try these out they really sometimes once you totally process your image if you come down here last it's going to really change the look of your image. So you might want to come down here, if you use these a lot, you might want to come down here first and try different ones and then tweak the, the controls to get it exactly like you like it. Now there are no black and white choices. Uh, if you shoot Fuji, you'll have like seven or eight black and white choices down here, which give you a lot of different black and white, white looks, which really usually look great. So. Uh, if you have Fuji, I encourage you to check down here if you want to convert your image to black and white and do it that way. Now, since we don't have those choices here, I'm going to go up to the HSL Color B&W tab and click on black and white and get this black and white shot. Eh, it's okay. Um, you could try some different things. Now, with the sky, maybe we want to make it more ominous looking. So you could take the blue tab and bring that down. And you could see how... It's, it's affecting the luminance value of anything that was blue in the image. Any blue pixels that were there are now being dark or darkened. And you can see that's making the sky much more ominous looking. So that's kind of cool. And uh, now we could affect the foliage with green and yellow. Usually yellow does more than green. So we could bring that up. Now we got to be careful. Our main focal point is the girl, although we're stealing a little bit of her thunder with the sky now. So if we bring yellow up too high, her hair starts looking like it's radioactive. So you got to be careful um, what you do in her skin tones too. 
So you gotta, you know, wonder what typically what I like to do, green does a lot, is I like to bring yellows up and greens down a lot of times, but in this case, I didn't like the look. Um, we could try doing it the opposite way, bring greens up a little bit and yellows down. Neither one is giving me. What we try to do, and I mentioned many times, you like to have tonal variations because when you have tonal variations, it adds interest. If you have just homogeneous green you know, going across, it's not as interesting as that you would be if you have all these different shades of gray. So um, what I actually said didn't make a lot of sense, but I think you understood what I meant. When you have what was green in the image being homogeneous gray, isn't as interesting as if you have a lot of different tonal variation in that gray. Um, so anyway, um, I like the black and white sky. Uh, the rest of it, not so much. Now the color, yeah, um, it's actually a little bit too colorful for me. So what you could do now is you could come here with saturation and just try sucking some of the color out of it. And Add some clarity. I kind of like that. You guys know I don't add clarity a lot to images. Um, kind of the opposite of what a lot of guys do. Um, so we add some clarity. I think clarity really helps this image, though. It really does. So I like those. And I think to finish it off, we'll use a vignette lightly. I don't like heavy vignettes. And you can see it lagged a little bit there. I kind of like that, I think. Um, if you're, um, you know, I don't know. It's okay. I think I like the black and white one. And once it renders, my computer is running a little slow now with all these different variations. I think I like the black and white one a little better. Um, but overall, I think it's, it's, they're both okay. So that's it. I hope that taught you some things about, uh, the transform tool was the main reason why I, um, I picked this image. I thought the transform tool, um, a lot of people don't understand it or how to use it. And I think this image really helped, uh, the compositional rules we talked about. I think the, uh, golden spiral worked well with this. Um, kind of like looped in right along where the, you know, the uh, uh, leading lines are going right to the woman uh, jogging through the scene. Um, but overall, um, I think we're okay. So if we, uh, there's our before, that's crop though, and there's our after on the color image. And on our virtual copy for our black and white image, it's just given us, there's our color image and then our black and white image. It's really lagging on my computer now. So, anyways, that's it. Which one do you like better? Black and white color? I don't know. Six of one, half a dozen the other as far as I'm looking at them. So that's it for episode nine. Thank you, everyone that watches my videos. I truly do appreciate it. I'll talk to you guys soon.